Hey, business building warrior, I've got a treat for you today. From time to time, well, actually about once a week or so, I like to go live in the Facebook group and invite any of the members who'd like to join me onto like a Zoom session where we can see each other and interact with each other on the screen. If you want to join us for one of these, by the way, typically I do it on Monday evenings around 5 p.m. Eastern time. That's 5 o'clock p.m. New York time. Most weeks, not every week, but this time I recorded the session. We don't record all of them, but we did this time. And we may do this a few times in the future as well, if this is something that we get some feedback from you saying you enjoy. So let me set this up a little bit and you can decide if this is an episode for you. We ask all of the members of our community, we got about 72,000 people in our Facebook group, to bring any questions they have to a live Zoom hangout where the topic is typically revolving around growing your business in e-commerce and on Amazon. So we get all kinds of interesting questions and you can see from the description today some of the questions that were tackled during the discussion time. A lot of times these Monday night meetings are a way for us to greet the newest members of our community. So you'll see some questions in there that kind of cater to the newer sellers who are trying to establish a business on Amazon. But just so you know, if this is one of your first episodes you've ever listened to of our podcast, my name is Jim. I'm the host most of the time on this show. We have some other great coaches who host as well from time to time. But this show has about 500 episodes or more of success story interviews with the students of ours who are taking the Proven Amazon course. That's what this community is about. That's what this show is about, helping you launch a great business using a course that's called, I'll give you the name again, it's the Proven Amazon Course. You can find details on that course at provenamazoncourse.com. So most of the episodes of this podcast are interviews with the students who are succeeding with that course. But we like to have some other content as well. You guys have requested it where we dive in and answer those questions. So in an open microphone setting, we captured some of the best questions from the community hanging out and I gave answers and you never know what interesting questions might pop up. And again, if you want to join us live, the best way to get in on this is to get into our Facebook group. There's a link at silentgym.com. You can get into our free Facebook group. There's also a link there to our Proven Amazon course. And you can hear all of our past podcast episodes by going there as well. A lot of our episodes only are found in audio format. And there's a link there. You can get an iTunes or Spotify or your favorite podcast listening app. And you can hear all those great interviews with our successful students. Something else we're very proud of, that free Facebook group I mentioned. You can jump into it and see for yourself. We have 1,700 tagged success posts from students using our Amazon training to build beautiful businesses. Many of those people go on to be guests on our show. But today, it's an open microphone It's me with the community hanging out, answering questions. And like I said, if you enjoy this, please let us know. We'll do more of this kind of thing. And plan to join us some Monday, 5 p.m. Eastern. Get into our Facebook group and look for the announcements. We'd love to have you join us live. We can interact. I'd love to answer your questions as well. I've been doing e-commerce for 20 years. It's the only income for my family. There's seven of us. We've homeschooled and raised five kids. They're getting married and moving out and getting older at this point. But the 20-year experiment was a wild success. We're so excited and happy to see how things have turned out for our kids, for our business, for our family, for the relationships. We love entrepreneurship and homeschooling under one roof. That's how we did life for 20 plus years. And it's been so rewarding. We want that for as many people as that want that for themselves as well. So we hit on some of those kind of topics on these discussions as well. You never know what you're going to get. But like I said, look at the description, see if there's some interesting topics there for you today that we're going to dive into. And thanks for listening to Silent Sales Machine Radio. Let's get over into the Q&A session with the other listeners. When you're doing retail arbitrage, like going through a grocery store, picking up stuff, do you do do like a tax exempt situation when you're doing checkout or just pay sales tax and move on? No reason not to. It's just kind of like a coupon. You know, how much do you take chasing a 50 cent coupon is the question really. So if it's worth it, worth it. If it's not, don't. When I'm first buying and testing an item, probably not. If I start buying, you know, 50 units a month of that or whatever, yeah. I've got my Walmart tax exempt. And if I'm placing a decent size order, I'll do it. You know, I'll save a few pennies or a few few dollars that way. But yeah, so the the short answer is it never hurts to save money as long as it's worth the time and effort and energy that goes into saving them. Because I, I just had a discussion with uh, our 
state tax office today, actually. Yeah. Uh, and I'm, I'm getting set up in the business. So I just sure. kind of was curious about that. So yeah, once you cool. get your tax exempt certificate, most mm-hmm. stores are going to take it. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. And it, you, whether you're shopping online or shopping in the store, if it's for resale, you don't have to pay taxes on that product. Yeah. Sweet. Absolutely. Stacey. Yeah. Good question, man. Anything else on your Thank mind? You. Um, well, I, I'm, like I said, I'm still going through all the training. I just signed up like Friday and then signed up to keep a course today. <laughs> so I'm very, very new. I haven't even bought my first product yet. So yeah, but I do have one other question though. Uh, you were talking about underserved um, uh, markets. Uh, so is, are you... <laughs> Kind of a follow up to the uh, FBA or MFA. Uh, so, if I send, if I find a uh, an ASIN that is underserved, or there's a lot like 50 sellers, like you were talking about, and I just send that to Amazon, they are the ones that picks where it needs to go. Correct. I don't. Okay, so it's not something that I say. Okay, I want this to go to uh, middle of Kansas. <laughs> you know, to serve that. That's community. a great question. I wish they would let us do that. And and there's some ways you can manip- manipulate, but not for a single unit. But a lot of times, even with Merchant Fulfill, you can get the same benefit. You know, okay. You can kind of like you're in the middle of nowhere location. We will Merchant Fulfill on fast moving items. It makes mm-hmm. a lot of sense to hold a few in Merchant Fulfill at a higher price point. Right. Because there will be, especially if you do next day delivery, that gives you an advantage over okay. a lot of the rest of the big cities and warehouses in the country. If someone near you needs that product quickly and you can ship it next day, you're eliminating 80% of the buy box competition. Okay. And people are going to look and you'll, you'll make sales. So if you got some fast moving ASINs, yeah, keep a few on hand. You'll be shocked how fast. A lot of times people say, no, I don't ever want to ship under any circumstances. I never want to ship anything out of my house. I'm like, oh, you're walking away from a lot of money. It could be yeah. you know, some of those fast moving ASINs. Put them out there because you, you can sell on the same ASIN. You can have it merchant fulfill and FBA. Oh, can you now? Okay. Absolutely. No reason. I not did not to. know that. Amazon okay, doesn't cool. mind. Yeah. All right. There's no reason for them to mind. Well, that's right. good to know. Mm-hmm. So you got to ship something. it anyway. <laughs> yeah. Like around Christmas time, a lot of times the stuff that's just flying off the shelf, right? And you just can't get your hands on it fast enough. Q4. Uh, a lot of people will say, I, I don't want to send this into Amazon and wait three weeks or four weeks for it to get checked in. <laughs> I'm just going to list it for sale while I'm in the store right now. Oh, and sweet. it'll sell before the shopping cart hits the register. <laughs> wow. Right? wow. If you're willing okay. to ship it yourself, ship it tomorrow. Yeah. I mean, Amazon's like, yeah, why wouldn't we let you do that? And rather than the customer has to wait three weeks for it to get here to our warehouse. Right. Okay. This makes sense. When you start thinking that, you know, the, the people who are receiving this inventory, think from their vantage point. You know, the United States is a big place and people live all over the place and there's items they can't get in certain regions. Of, and if they can get it a day or two from now and you're the one that can make that happen, they don't care if it's coming from Amazon or coming from your garage. They don't care. They just want to get their right. hands. Right. Get, you know, test, get stuff for sale. The other thing I want to talk to you about, Stacy, is our Kickstart program since you're new. Have you heard about that yet? Actually, I've signed up for it, but uh, it hasn't Art. started for me yet. Gotcha. So uh, I, I, I did sign up for it. Okay. For those who don't know, Stacy made a great decision. It's $40 one-time payment. It should be like 1000 for the value you're going to get because it's four sessions with a coach on our team. It's a group sessions, kind of like what we're doing right now, except it's a smaller group of the most recent proven Amazon course students who said, yeah, I'll pay 40 bucks for this. It's four one-hour plus sessions where we get you from not knowing anything to making your first sale is the goal. Any of the confusion about the tools you need or how this works, or is this a good ASIN and getting set up. Uh, some people find tremendous value in doing it as a group and having a coach there just kind of boosting you along. And again, a reminder, all of our coaches, anyone who's doing the Kickstart or any of the other coaches on our team, they are all running very successful Amazon selling businesses. So you're being coached by somebody who's doing this at scale. That's the person coaching you. We're very proud of the fact. It's very unique in the industry, actually. Most e-commerce coaching programs, you're getting a script reader or someone working out of a workbook. Uh, but that's not the way we do things here. So, awesome. Good to meet you, Stacy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your help. Of course. 
if someone's starting off with just a little bit of capital, how, how long can it take before they start paying themselves? Also, is there a course or information about how to avoid IP complaints? Is there an app that helps you identify a possible IP complaints? Three great questions. One of my uh, favorite recent podcast episodes was to address, I'll address all three of your questions, a little story to address the first one. My aunt who works in my warehouse with my mom and a couple of my kids and a few of the people who run the food pantry from the local church that we attend, that's my warehouse staff and a couple of other people that are in and out. Uh, my aunt has a chiropractor and her chiropractor was asking her, this is a couple of years ago, she was at the chiropractor getting her back adjusted. And he's like, what do you, he said, what work do you, I just kind of, you know, chiropractors ask those kind of questions. She's like, oh, I work at a warehouse. Now she doesn't lift heavy boxes. We don't let her do that. She's in her early seventies. You know, like, Hey, you know, take it easy. She's, she's more the number cruncher for us, but she's like, I work at my, my nephew's warehouse. He's like, Oh, what's he do? Amazon selling. He's like, Oh, I've always kind of wanted to hear about that. You know, and she's told him about our podcast. Next thing I know, I didn't, I didn't know this, but the, the next thing that happened is he, he really starts listening and loving it. And he's trying to pay off a whole bunch of student loans as a chiropractor working, you know, five, six days a week. Um, and he starts getting into Amazon and he starts diving into the proven Amazon course. He's used, and here's the beautiful part of the story to answer the first part of your question here, Missy, uh, or is it Missy or Elena? It's, it has both on here. It doesn't matter. It's one of the two of you, I'm assuming. He started off with $200. That's it. He's a chiropractor. He's got more money in the bank. He could have tapped into more funds than that. But the reason I love his story is he drew a hard line at $200. I'm not spending another penny more. With those first $200, he bought the proven Amazon course and his inventory in Keepa. That's it. And he started scaling, rolling the money back in, rolling the money back in. Jump forward. We had him on the podcast. It's been, I don't know, probably 50 episodes or so back. You can search for chiropractor, chiropractic on our podcast. Use Google to search silentgym.com for chiropractor. You'll find it. If you can't find it, look in the Facebook group because a few people have talked about it. Look for the word chiropractor, chiropractic. Uh, and he's now paid off tens of thousands of dollars of student debt. He's down to work in a day or two a week in his practice, making way more money than he was before, never having used another penny. He rolled that $200 over and over and over, just kept compounding it. Because when you're getting a, a 40 to 80% ROI and you're rolling your money over every few weeks, that grows pretty fast. And that's what he did. He paid for coaching out of that same $200 that compounded over the first three or four months. Bought coaching, full price, loved it, swears by it. It's got to get a coach. But 200 bucks, that's it. Do the math sometimes. Just get your calculator out. 200 times 1.4. That's a 40% ROI. Then put times 1.4, do it again. Then do times 1.4, do it again. How many times do you have to roll that money over at a 40% return on investment before you're looking at some significant money? So start with $100 times 1.4. Like I'm just going to do it right now because I, I don't know exactly off the top of my head what that would be, but $100 times 1.4. That's my 40% return ROI equals $140 times 1.4. I've turned it twice now. I got $200. I've doubled my money turning it twice times 1.4, 274. I've almost tripled my money times 1.4. I'm at 384 turning it over four times. That 100 is turned into 384. So you can see where you keep rolling it back over. You're rolling your profits back into, you're not paying yourself yet. So when should I start paying myself? Well, you start paying yourself when you're okay with slowing how fast your net, how fast your capital is growing. So you start paying yourself when you're okay slowing down. That's the same thing with every business expense you have. Is it worth slowing down the capital that you have working in your business? So, so your question is, at what point do I start paying myself? It's at the point where your business can continue scaling at the pace you want and you're not missing that revenue that's helping you scale. But the nice thing is, once you've got a predictable this is where risk, every business has risk. There's no such thing as a business without risk. And one of the risks you can start to take once you're confident in your system is you can use other people's money, which comes with a cost. You know, credit card, a loan from a friend, whatever. You're going to have to pay it back plus a little bit. That's the risk. But if you can get outside capital into your system, now suddenly instead of playing with, you know, $100 to start with on our system, we've got, you know, $1,000 
that we're playing with. But we've got to, and, I, and you don't do this as a new seller. No new seller should go out and get a big loan. No new seller should quit their job. Our chiropractic friend who started with two hundred dollars, he rolled it and rolled it and rolled it and rolled it and rolled it. To my knowledge, he's never taken any outside funds. But at the point where he's very confident in his 30, 40, 50, 80 percent ROI over and over and over again, he very easily could have taken some outside funds and justified it. Take some money. On maybe it's a 0% interest credit card. As long as you're paying it off within 30 days, there's no penalties, nothing happening. And you just roll it and roll it and roll it and take advantage of that outside fund. So you can grow a lot faster and potentially get to where you're trying to go. But credit is a risk. Leveraging is always a risk. Uh, so I can't answer that question for you. It's a budgeting question. How much money do you need a month to live on? Can you make that money from somewhere else while you scale your business as much as you can? Every extra month that you roll that money over instead of pulling some out means you're going to be at a much better place six months, a year, two years from now because you've been rolling more money over. So hopefully that helps you out. It's a good question, Missy slash Lena. And they also said, uh, is there a course information on how to avoid IP complaints? Absolutely. The number one tip that will help you avoid 95% of all the IP complaints is pay attention to Keepa. If there's just one seller or if it frequently drops down to just one seller, that probably means that it's a brand that doesn't want you there and they're going to do what they can to make your life miserable. Now, in a lot of cases, just because the brand's trying to make your life miserable doesn't mean you can't sell that product. The vast majority of the time, it doesn't. First sale doctrine means it's legal for you to sell that item. Just on Amazon, have they set their listing up in such a way that they can accuse you of trademark infringement or copyright or whatever. In no case are you getting yourself into legal trouble unless you're selling counterfeits and blatantly ignoring US law. But if you're just breaking an Amazon policy, the worst case scenario, 99.99999% of the time is wrist slap, possible temporary suspension. You're back up and going in a short period of time. Many of the most successful sellers in our community get numerous IP complaints per week. So the premise of your question is, how can I avoid IP complaints? The premise is, IP complaints are going to sink my business if I get too many. No, you want to avoid them, but they're not going to sink your business. It's kind of this little gray area game that you play. But in the, of the thousands and thousands of students that we've trained over the 12 plus years that we've been teaching Amazon strategy, I'm aware of fewer than five people who've been permanently suspended from our community. And all of them were ignoring, blatantly ignoring policy. And a few of them just cashed in at that point and they said they were done. Two or three of them, like, ah, I'm out. They had other things going. They had other income streams. They just quit. They, all, any of them could have got their business back had they persisted. And I'm convinced with persistence, any suspension is temporary. Amazon is very, very friendly. As long as you're not buying counterfeit Nikes from China, you know, breaking laws, if you're not breaking law, you're going to be fine. So don't be afraid of IP complaints. Do avoid them. Look for sellers who are selling against their own brand as evidenced by one seller, you see a hot, you send this selling a ton and then you look and there's one seller and then there's four sellers and then there's one for a long time and then there's five sellers and then there's one. Stay away. That's the brand trying to sell their own stuff and they don't want you there. They're not going to like you. They're going to ask their lawyer to try to scare you. And so you're going to get a scary lawyer letter. Nobody wants that. Just don't sell the product. It's not worth getting in the mud when there's thousands and thousands of other ASINs you could sell against. There we go. That's me talking about IP. And if you listen to our podcast, you're going to hear these kind of things a lot. Our Wednesday episodes, the, the episodes that drop on Wednesdays the past three to four months, you'll hear Jeff Schick interviewed. At the end of the episode, he'll spend 5, 10, 15 minutes with me putting you at ease about Amazon legal and policy. He's a lawyer. You can put him on retainer a uh, little over a dollar a day. No, it's about 2 or $3. I think it's $3 a day, I think is what it is. I think it's about $80, $90, something like that. Put him on retainer, any of these things that ever happened to you, you're good. But it used to be the only recourse you had when you got some of these scary letters, which aren't scary. Most of them you just throw in the trash. But it was to call someone and say, hey, three to $5,000. <laughs> that was what they're going to charge you if you got suspended or you're facing needing a, a plan of action or something. Now, you know, for 90 bucks a month, once your business has scaled to the point where that's a fairly minor hit, it makes sense to do. So most people who are selling over $10,000 a month, it makes a lot of sense for them to, to put Jeff on retainer just so they can stop worrying about this issue entirely. 
Uh, as a new seller, just don't be, don't be frightened that, thinking that things are going to legally be an issue for you. They just aren't. If you're, if you're buying legitimate inventory from legitimate retailers with legitimate receipts, some of the big mistakes you can make is getting off into closeouts and liquidations. Don't do it. Huge, horrible mistake. Do not do it. Um, placing orders through distributors that put their name on the invoice instead of your name on the invoice. Like this big warehouse of all these great things that you could be selling. No, we don't do that because the invoice is on their name. And if there's a complaint and Amazon says, hey, we need to see the original invoice, you send it in, it's got different companies. Like, no, we need to see the invoice with your name on it where you bought from a legitimate source. Like, oh, I don't have that. I bought from a distributor that buys things for Amazon sellers. Ah, we can't sign off on that. There's That's a red flag. And, and this is the kind of stuff that Jeff and I talk about on Wednesdays. All right. So hopefully that's how. Do I need an app to help me avoid IP complaints? Some people like them. I just look at Keepa. I look at Keepa. I look for the skateboard ramp of death. It's, you know, a bunch of sellers, then drops to one. Bunch of sellers, then the lawyer sends a letter and it drops to one. If you avoid the skateboard ramp of death, that's 95% of the IP complaints you'll ever get. Do I have buy button strategies in the course? Uh, the premise behind that question is you get some kind of unique advantage with buy box strategies. That's a buzzword on YouTube. I'll teach you how to win the buy box. Well, what we know around here doing Amazon for 12 years is if you're selling up against a bunch of other sellers and you're bouncing around on different ASINs and you're trying to win the buy box, you probably don't understand Amazon where the buy box isn't as important as everyone makes it out to be because the buy box is regional. Meaning the buy box that you see at your house right now is very different than the buy box that I see at my house right now on the same ASIN. So what good is it to try to win the buy box? If you want to win as many as possible, be the lowest price, but that's probably going to mean you're not making any money. So the strategies are, how do I keep a high buy box price and still make sales? The answer there is you sell stuff that moves fast. So there's plenty of people willing to pay more because they want it quickly. That's one strategy. So yeah, there's all kinds of buy box strategy in our content materials, but we don't focus in and obsess over the buy box because it's just not necessary. I would say of the, let's say we grabbed the 500 top performing replens sellers in our community and said, how important is buy box in your day-to-day -day decisions and how much time do you spend looking, about, looking at it or thinking about it? They would all say, it's barely relevant in my business of the 50 things I'm going to think about any given day, that doesn't even show up on my radar. But new sellers obsess over it because they think, I got to be the best in the buy box to win the sales. No, you don't. The most valuable thing the buy box tells you is, what's my worst case scenario? That's what the buy box line is good for. You look on Keepa, you see this buy box line? That's the line where you can probably sell it pretty fast if you drop to that point. So will I break even or lose a couple bucks? If so, it's probably worth testing. But there's a whole lot of sales happening above the buy box if it's a fast mover. Do you recommend we have an LLC and business bank account set up? Man, we get that question so much. Uh, there's nothing wrong with having an LLC. I would say you talk to any business lawyer and you walk up to him and say, I have a question for you. Should I open an LLC because I'm considering stop? Yes, launch an LLC. There's never a bad time to launch an LLC. It's, there's, there's really no situation like, oh man, why did you open an LLC? You're, what are you crazy? Like, no, it's like, <laughs> it's kind of like buying another $10,000 of life insurance. Like, yeah, sure. Why not? Go for it. Now it's easier to do now than it will be later. Yeah. Makes sense. Do you have to do it? No. If my right-hand man, Nathan, who's been with me 20 years, our coaching director was here, he'd say, yeah, get your LLC early on, do it. And I, and, and me, I'm more of the, here's what I want you to do. Sell something. Let me grab you by the shoulders. Look me in the eye. Sell something. Stop getting ready to get ready to get ready to get ready to start a business. Business cards, office chair. I don't know if I like the color of paint in my office. I think I need to change it to a darker shade of blue before I feel really motivated. Like those people drive me nuts. <laughs> it's like, sell something, right? So I put this in that same conversation as like, do I need a separate account? Do I need an accountant? Do I need? Yeah, you're going to need those things, but come on, dude sell something and let that momentum and that energy. And that's just me. You know, once I see that proof of concept profit, I'm ready to go set the world on fire and check all those boxes, man. I'm good to go. I got proof. I'm going to go check those boxes. Hey, I saw that little wave, Glenn. Thank you for that. Yep. But uh, yeah, it, it never hurts to do an LLC, set your business up as one. But if you didn't, don't be thinking, oh no, 
it's the end of the world. Make friends with a good local accountant, small business accountant who's been doing accounting for 30 years or more. And just say, hey, I'm looking to start my own business. Help me walk through the process here. I'll buy you lunch and I'll let you do my books. A good accountant's going to pay for themselves. You don't want them to do your bookkeeping. You do want them to do your taxes and to give you advice and business advice in general. They know small business accountants know people. They know the the mayor. They know the good lawyers. They know the good people who can help you with insurance. They know the realtors. They know whose business is making money and whose isn't. (laughs) You want the guy that's been doing it a while. He can connect you with the people who've been running profitable businesses and keeping their life on the up and up in your area. Those are good people to know. So get a good local accountant, have a conversation, offer to buy them lunch, ideally after April 15th, not before, because they'll think you're crazy if you talk to them in early April. We're in the sweet time of the year to really be uh, schmoozing up with accountants. You know, their, their business has slowed down dramatically. Their time, they're in relationship building mode right now. Call one of them. Compliance documents for toys. Ooh, that's a good one, Judith. I love this question. If it hasn't happened yet, it's going to happen very soon. I had a good question, a good conversation with Jeff Schick on a Wednesday episode of the podcast. I'm not sure which one. I apologize. This is why you can't miss any episodes. (laughs) But this whole toy compliance thing, it's a non-issue. It's a non-issue. Let's say you're selling a toy and Amazon says, hey, we need a compliance certificate or this ASIN is going to be shut down on date X. Every seller gets that same compliance certificate. Odds are one of them is going to track it down and send it in. If they don't, the worst case scenario is Amazon sends you those toys back. And you flip them on eBay or Facebook Marketplace. So if you're doing the replens model and you got two or three units of anything, you can basically ignore those toy compliance requests. Jump in, have fun. Toys are wide open again, baby. Go for it. A lot of sellers don't realize this. A lot of sellers moved away from toys a couple of years ago thinking, oh, I don't want those compliance certificates, those scary compliance certificates. No, they're not saying they're going to slap you on the wrist. They're saying that ASIN will get shut down if none of the sellers send them one. So maybe it can be you that tracks down the compliance certificate. You're doing a service to all the rest of us. But odds are, if there's a handful of sellers, someone else is going to send it in on time. And what happens typically is Amazon does not tell anybody that they've received the compliance certificate. So they'll send it to 15 sellers. And let's say three of them send it in. And they haven't told you that they have. So you don't know. And here comes that date on the calendar. And that date comes and then it goes. And like, oh, wow, okay. So the compliance certificate thing, someone else took care of it. But the beautiful part is, this is where you're smart to hang out in this community and ask smart questions like that. Let's say there's 15 sellers. They all panicked. Thinking, oh, here here comes that scary date. The ASIN is going to be shut off. Here it comes. I better drop my price into the basement. And you're sitting up here at profit land and they're down there in the plane in the mud with the (laughs) price tanking pig land, right? So you got the price tankers down here getting rid of their inventory. It's flying off the shelf because the price is so low, which rises that listing in Amazon's catalog because so many people are paying attention to it because it's such a good bargain. But then here comes that date. Who's left? You and one other seller who knows how the game's played, sitting at a great profit on a really high-ranked ASIN. And you just sell all your units in a single day at a great profit. Isn't that fun? If you didn't follow me, listen to the recording of that in slow motion (laughs) a couple times. It'll make a lot of sense. Don't be afraid of toy certificates. Price high when you see one and just wait and watch what happens. The vast majority of the time, you're going to end up making some sales at a high profit, especially if it's a fast-moving ASIN. If it's not a fast-moving ASIN, why are you trying to do replans on a slow-moving ASIN? Stop it. Sell replans on fast-moving ASINs. You get the toy compliance certificate. That's a payday. Do you recommend trying to ship out a box first or getting a coach first if you're not really that confident? You know, when should I get a coach is the premise behind your question. At what point does it make the most sense? Shira is asking. And Eric, man, you're being so patient, dude. I'm sorry. I forgot about you. I promise I'm going to commit as much time as you want to getting whatever issues you've got. (laughs) Thank you, my friend. (laughs) You're so patient. I completely forgot that I was going to get to you here in a minute. Uh, so we'll take our time and get to your questions here. Ed, let me just finish answering Shira's question about coaching and then we'll jump over and, and see what you got. Uh, so when does it make sense to start coaching? It depends on, there's so many factors. It really is a conversation. So call our coaching office, set up an appointment, put a time on your schedule. Jim Cochran, I'm sorry, silentgym.com has a link to Jim Cochran Coaching. You can set an appointment, someone will call you or you can call them anytime during business hours. And these are consultants who've been with me in all cases for a very long time. 
they're going to ask you a series of questions. How well-funded are you right now? Are you in a position where you can start a business? Is your spouse on board? How much time do you have? What other commitments do you have? What season of life are you in? What else, what other businesses are you looking at? Those kinds of questions, like let's really have a conversation. Does this make sense for you to have a coach right now? Or should you just get into the proven Amazon course and play an hour here and there over the next six months and see if this is for you? How serious are you? The thing coaching does is it propels you forward. In the next two to three months, you could propel yourself forward nine months to a year or more because of the relationships, the connections. Coaching isn't just about getting a coach either. One thing, you're going to get my cell phone number. You can text me anytime. I'm there to help you out. No one ever abuses it. And the nice thing about not being the smartest person on your team is I can make that offer. And if someone texts me something, I'm like, I have no idea how to help them with that. I just send it to someone smarter on my team and they help them. So I love doing that, connecting with every student. You're going to get a reactive and a proactive coach, someone who answers your texts anytime, your emails anytime you want to send them, and then someone else who you schedule appointments with. They're going to be your liaison into the community. You have a question about the event or a new course that's coming or, hey, should I focus on private label yet? Am I ready for that yet? You just, you've got a mentor. There's all kinds of benefits to the coaching program, but it's really what, at what point are you ready to accelerate forward six to nine months very quickly? Because if they're going to, you know, they can put their foot in the gas as much as you want. You're not going to outpace your coach. We can, we encourage you to use your sessions up often, plow through them, build a relationship with your coach, do the things they're telling you to do. Uh, so it's really up to you. If you're sending in your first box, that's fine. Do it. If you make a mistake, that's fine. You'll learn from it. You know, you'll focus on the lesson instead of focusing on the loss. You may lose a little money. You may have made a mistake. That's fine. You're not going to break anything. It's okay. Send in that first box. Kickstart is very helpful for people who are kind of at this stage too, by the way, Shira. So you may want to consider jumping into Kickstart. And that'll give you a little bit of a taste of, oh, you started Kickstart today. Wow, that's awesome. Okay, so I just should have scrolled down a little further here. Um, Shira said she started Kickstart today. Super smart. If anyone's wondering about Kickstart again, I'll repeat myself, get to silentgym.com, click on support, send an email to our support team and say, Jim is talking about Kickstart. Can you send me to the page? And you'll see a little video of me talking about Kickstart and we'll get you off and rolling. Just sign up 40 bucks one time. All right, so hopefully that helps you out. Shira, is coaching right for you? It requires a half hour, 45 minute conversation. We're happy to have that chat with you. What's on your mind, so buddy? So the question is around when Amazon sends um, products back to me that for whatever reason, you know, I couldn't lower it enough to sell it, wouldn't make a profit, so forth and so on. It sat in inventory, you know, 180 plus days and, and they just sent it back, something back. Sure. And so sometimes I, I read on the group about how other sellers take it. And like you said a few moments ago, Oh, go ahead and flip it on Facebook or maybe flip it on eBay or, you know, sell it some kind of way. Mm -hmm. Or sometimes people even FBM it right back to, to, to Amazon. And so my question is, I've already paid to send the product into Amazon, of course. Right. And now Amazon has to look, blah, blah, blah. We're sending this back to you. I paid shipping for that, of course, or some kind of fee as well. And so when products come back, what is some advice around trying to get those out my door and make kind of that money back? I got you. Yeah, there's a good number of things that you can do with it. Uh, not the least of which is, write it off, uh, which is something we tend to do a decent amount of. Anyone who's selling physical product, I've been doing this 20 years, and I can tell you, anyone who's selling physical goods, which is what we're doing, is going to wind up with a death pile. Like, ah, what do I do with this stuff? We're going to have a yard sale for our warehouse here soon and just like, blow it all. It's all got to go. Blow it all out. Hopefully sell, you know, $1,500 to $3,000 of the product in a day. Just people who walk up and buy it, looking for bargains and deals, right? So we just kind of let it accumulate and then do one big sale and when the weather's nice. Advertise it on Facebook Marketplace. Uh, you can list certainly list it on eBay. Uh, you can uh, you can go through uh, and list try listing some of it on Walmart, which we've started doing. Walmart.com uh, as well, and you can keep it listed as merchant fulfilled on Amazon. 
there's no long-term storage fee if you're merchant fulfilling, right? So yeah. keep it listed there as well. Um, and you know, when I, when you kind of take a picture and bundle stuff together, I I really like Facebook Marketplace for that. It's like, hey, we overbought. We've got 23 units of this. You'll be shocked how many people are texting you almost to me, like, oh yeah, we'll come buy it. You know, people looking for a deal. So you know, there's all kinds of creative ideas. There's not one great solution that we found, and because we could be talking about any kind of number of random products here, uh, but the reality is, on a certain percentage of your products you're just going to end up with more inventory than you planned on. But it allowed, this allows me the opportunity to remind everybody, this is why we say inch deep, mile wide. We're not talking about 300, 300 units of anything. Yeah, We're talking about one month's worth. That's the most you'll ever be stuck with because that's how many we tell you. Never send in more than one month's worth, meaning I can confidently sell these in a month. So at some point you overbought. You thought, oh, I can sell 20 in a month. Ah, no, you only sold four in a month. Your system was off a little bit. Why did you buy 20 when you should have only bought four? What caused you to do that? It's a chance to you know, review internally systems. Make sure that you're not overbuying by habit. If you're getting a lot of stuff back all the time, well, you're overbuying. You're not right. finding good ASINs. Right. Right. Lots so there's a learning lesson moments. in everything that comes back. What was the lesson? What did we just learn here? How much did this little lesson cost me? And how am I going to make sure I don't make the same mistake again? Right? It's fine to make mistakes. You want to be making mistakes constantly. You want to be failing constantly, but you don't want to be failing at the same things constantly. <laughs> I think that's the right. definition of insanity somewhere, right? So you right. Just want to be learning as you fail. Right. Do you, Is that do helpful? You, would you, very helpful. Awesome. Would you say that 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 more of the time it's going to be when they sent something back like that, that more of the time it's going to be like, I at least want to get something back for these items. You know, you're asking me math decision, math questions without giving me the numbers. I can't tell you for sure. You know, for me, if it's, I've basically told my team, if it's less than a $10 decision, you know, you got some items here. Like, even if everything goes great, we're only going to make 10 bucks. Send that to the food pantry. Like I told you, you know, our the, two of the main people on my team running our team, Ruben and Melissa, run the largest food pantry in the area. Good people to have friends with, you know, because you can feel like, all right, I'm going to bless some people. Let's just, just send it over there. We had a good day. You know, we made $3,000 today. Yeah, we can afford to send $75,000 worth of inventory over to the food pantry today. That's great. Right, you just write it off and be done with it. Other people are like really watching their nickels and dimes and like, man, this is gonna hurt. So, how much is it gonna hurt? I need to know the numbers. If you sat on it for two months and you could get a hundred bucks out of it, is that worth your time, effort, and energy to list it on eBay and Facebook Marketplace? For some people, they'd be like, absolutely, yes, it's worth a hundred bucks for me to take an extra couple months and list it on three marketplaces. Other people, like, are you kidding me? (laughs) No, I don't care if it's a thousand dollars and I can go through all that work, donate it. So it really is, it's a math question that only you can answer. But I would say your odds are really high of selling good ASINs on other marketplaces if Amazon sends it back to you for some reason. As long as you're buying good ASINs, you know, stuff that's moving. We don't send stuff in that's going to sit. Somewhere you made a miscalculation. Either someone came in with 1,500 units and undercut you in the price on a really fast moving ASIN. Now you got them back, you can probably move that somewhere else. Well, if you're buying slow moving ASINs, however, <sighs> it's your it's your fault. It's like take your beating, donate the product, and stop buying bad ASINs. That's right. It's That's right. you know, I, I can't answer that for you in general, but I can say that as a as a general rule, about half your death pile is gonna haunt your dreams the rest of your life. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like surely someone's gonna want this. It's like, what's that stuff still doing in the corner? We've had it for three years. Like, we just give it away, get it out of here. We even ran a yard sale and nobody wanted it. Like, just it's time to donate. Get it out. About half your death pile. I think that's probably just what I've observed over the years. The other half of the death pile, it's worth doing something with. You'll turn it into some cash. But yeah, good question, Eric. Anything else I can help you out with, man? That's all I got right now. All right. I appreciate your patience tonight, my friend. That was awesome of you. All right, hey, are you coming to the, the uh, conference in July? You know what? I haven't planned on it. I don't. 
I don't believe I will just due to my, my regular work that I do. I got you. Well, because you're such a patient, friendly guy, can I get your free live stream? If you send me a private message when we're done here on Facebook and remind me, say, hey, I'm Eric, the patient guy. You offered free live stream. I'll get you live stream to the event, okay? I will definitely do that. All right, buddy. Yeah, sometime the next day or two, shoot me a note. Okay. Thanks so much for speaking with me right now. Yes, sir. Have a great evening. Oh, someone's asking if they can do this business in a small efficiency apartment. I'm going to take that as my last question. I'm going to wrap this up. And Brittany, thanks for hanging out with me, keeping your camera on. That's so sweet of you. Thank you, my friend. Uh, anyone else wants to kick on the camera? I like to grab a little screenshot too. I'll give you guys a countdown once we get a bunch of cameras on. Whoever wants to turn it on here. If you think, oh, I'll turn it on for a few seconds for Jim. Yeah, that's great. Then we get a little screenshot and show everybody participating. So leave your camera on for a minute. I'm going to answer this question and then uh, we'll, we'll call it a night for those of you who can turn on your cameras. If you're driving, don't, you don't have to. I don't want to cause any wrecks here. Uh, can I do this business from a small efficiency apartment? Absolutely, you can because, hang with me on this example, we have very successful students in our community who live outside the United States who never see or touch their inventory. They, it doesn't ship to their apartment. They're using a prep center in the United States. So they order their inventory online, they ship it to a prep center in the United States who receives it, sends it into Amazon after slapping stickers on it, inventory sells. One of the coaches on our team, Joseph Biz is his last name. What a great name for an entrepreneur, right? He lives in Slovakia. He's a coach on our team. He has a very successful Amazon replens business. He's selling a lot of products in the US, never sees them, never touches them. So if you can do that from outside the US, surely you can do it inside the US too, right? With a few extra advantages out of your efficiency apartment, you can ship a few merchant fulfill items. You can bring a little bit of inventory home, but you can use a prep center. You'll hear us talk about our Prep Center Network, prepcenternetwork.com is a free service to the Amazon seller community at large where we keep track of all the people who will receive your inventory on your behalf, prep it for you, slap some stickers on it and send it into Amazon. So you don't have to do that part. So if you shop online and have it sent to them and set it to your house, now you can live in a shoebox if you want to because it doesn't matter where you live, your inventory is being handled by somebody else at every step of the process. So absolutely, you can live in an efficiency apartment and still do this business or many of the other business models that we teach around here. Remember, replens is just the starter model, but we're very confident that it has a very low risk, a very low expense. You can put money in the bank while you learn, and it has a high odds of success if you follow the system. That's why we start people there. It gives you confidence, gives you boost, gives you some resources to start to build into some of these other income streams that we're so excited about around here. Hey, before I let you go, quick question. Would you like to win the buy box more often on Amazon at higher prices without engaging in all the price wars? I've got to tell you about sellersnap.io. It's an artificial intelligence powered repricer and Amazon analytics tool. And they're offering our community a great discount of 20% off for the first three months when you check them out. I'm talking about Sellersnap. You can visit their website at sellersnap.io. And when you go to check out, get that 20% off coupon by using the coupon code PROVENCONFERENCE2023. That's PROVENCONFERENCE2023, all one word. That's going to get you a huge discount. Go check them out at sellersnap.io. Thanks for listening. We'll have another great episode for you very soon. 